We've been working our way through the Book of Romans, with Paul writing from a pretty bleak perspective about the bad news over the last few weeks. That is, that no one is righteous, not no one is worthy, not even one. Today, though, we turn a corner and hear two of the most important words in the whole Bible. Stick around and we'll find out what they are. Welcome to St John's, I'm Andy, our digital minister. As watching online is a very one-way medium, it'd be really wonderful to get to know each other better. During or after the service, jump onto our website, stjohnsdc.org.au, and click the connect button. You'll be given a form there that goes to our staff team, and if you indicate that you've been watching online, I'll follow up and reach out. Let's open our Bibles together now to Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 31. Hi, my name's Kylie. I'm a volunteer here at St. John's. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 31. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I once heard a minister share a story about chatting with one of his church members at the church door as he shook hands with people as they were leaving. And the man said to him, if you preach one more sermon on sin, I'm going to scream and walk out. Well, you might have felt like that man over these past few weeks as we've been working through the book of Romans. Uh, Though, just to be clear, no one has said that to me. Paul opened his letter by introducing the gospel, the good news about Jesus. But since then, we've worked through two chapters full of bad news. The bad news about humans who have ignored and rejected God, their creator. And Paul has been systematically telling us that this bad news affects everyone. It's not that some people have rejected God, while others haven't. It's not that good people who try hard will be okay, and it's only murderers and rapists who will face God's judgment. Now, as we heard last week, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands There is no one who seeks God. It seems like unrelenting bad news. Uh, Paul's painted the canvas all in black paint. Everyone stands under the right and fair judgment of God. We've brought this on ourselves by rejecting God. We're under the power of sin and we have no power to save ourselves. It's enough to make you scream. But this black background enables us to see the light and the goodness of God's rescue more clearly. And that's what we get finally in today's passage from Romans. 
against this dark and seemingly hopeless background, we read two of the most hope-filled words in the Bible. But now. That's how verse 21 opens. But now. Everyone stands under the judgment of God, but now. We're under the power of sin and we've got no power to save ourselves, but now. These two words make the transition to the stunning good news of God's rescue plan for us and for everyone. And in this passage, we see that this good news of rescue comes by grace alone. It's God's initiative from first to last. Through Jesus alone, he's the saviour and rescuer. And it's received by faith alone. All we do is to receive this gift from God alone. Grace alone, Jesus alone, faith alone. These three phrases are key things for us to grab hold of. And in the course of Christian history, especially during the 16th century Reformation, they've been catch cries of our faith, showing the wonderful good news of God's rescue of us, even against the blackest backdrop of our sin. So grab your Bibles and let's unpack it together. So firstly, we are saved by God's grace alone. Verse 21 says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Paul's been arguing that the Old Testament law cannot save people because we fail to keep the law and so are law breakers. So God's solution to our problem is going to come apart from the law. And yet at the same time, the whole Old Testament, the law and the prophets announce this good news and point to this good news. And Paul uses the phrase here, the righteousness of God, to describe this good news. Now we've come across that phrase already all the way back in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul said, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Uh, and Joel helpfully said that the righteousness of God could be speaking about who God is, that his character is right or just, uh, could be speaking about what God does, that God always acts rightly, fairly and justly, or it could be about what God gives, that God gives us the righteousness of Jesus and puts us right with him. Uh, and when Joel was speaking on uh, that verse in chapter one, he said that the righteousness of God relates to all three of these things. And we see that spelled out again for us very clearly in our passage today. So Paul is using this righteousness language all throughout this passage, though you might miss some of them. So in verse 21, he speaks about the righteousness of God. In verse 22, he says that this righteousness is given. In verse 24, he says that we are all justified freely by his grace. Now, that's one that you might miss, but the word justified is exactly the same word as the word for righteous. Uh, we could translate it as righteousified, making up a word there, or perhaps declared righteous freely by his grace. And in verses 25 and 26, God demonstrates his righteousness. Now, what do you notice about all of those expressions? In every single case, it is God who takes the initiative to drive our rescue. And they all come freely from him as a gift and by his grace. Right, for starters, it is the righteousness of God. It belongs to him and it comes from him. We're told that the righteousness is given. It's a gift from him. In case you missed that, we're told all are justified freely and by his grace. This is not something that we earn or we deserve. 
It's free and it's given by grace. And it's done in order to display God's righteousness too. So from first to last, we're saved by God's generous initiative. We're saved by God's gracious and free gift to us, not because we deserve it. It's God's grace alone that saves us. There's no way that we can sort of climb our way up to God. There's no way that we can earn the favour of God. There are, there's no works or rituals or acts of goodness that can somehow climb our way to God. Rather, it's entirely God who takes the initiative and who reaches down to us in grace that saves us. We're saved by God's grace alone. But secondly, we're saved through Jesus alone. That truth is expressed throughout the passage over and over again. So in verse 22, we read that God's righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. In verse 24, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. We're saved through God's grace and by his initiative, but he acts to save us solely through the work of his son, Jesus. Now, the way that Jesus saves us is so wonderful and so beautiful that it's described in a number of different ways in the Bible. You can think of it a bit like, you know, a stunning diamond. And if you look at it from different angles, there's always something new to see, capturing some of the beauty depending on the way that you look at it. And even in this passage, there are at least three different images or pictures of what Jesus does as he saves us. So we're told that Jesus redeems us. That's the language of the marketplace. It's the language of rescuing slaves and setting them free. Uh, we're enslaved by sin and we're held under its power. Right? We can't escape. We can't rescue ourselves. Uh, Jesus says that anyone who sins is a slave to sin. But what Jesus does, he redeems us from slavery to sin. To redeem something is, is to buy, buy it back. So to redeem is to buy someone out of slavery, to set them free at some price. What's the price? Well, the price is Jesus' own blood. By his death on the cross, he frees us from slavery to sin. We're also told that Jesus is a sacrifice of atonement. So that shifts from the, the marketplace redeeming slaves to the temple where sacrifices are offered. So faced with the righteous anger of God, a sacrifice is needed which will deal with sin, which will deal with God's anger against sin, and which will bring us back into relationship with God. What we need is atonement. Now that word means exactly what it says if you break it down. Atonement means at one bringing two people who are separated together as one. It's about turning away God's anger and restoring relationship. And Jesus does that in offering himself as a sacrifice for sin in our place. So as Jesus dies on the cross, he experiences the condemnation, the judgment, and the anger of God. Not because he deserved it, I mean, he lived an utterly perfect life. But he's there in our place, taking the wrath and the judgment that we deserve so that we don't have to. So Jesus redeems us and Jesus offers himself as a sacrifice of atonement. But we're also told that through Jesus, we are justified. So this now is the language of the law court. We stand charged and guilty. We stand before the heavenly judge for our sin and our rebellion. And frankly, our case doesn't have a leg to stand on. But through Jesus, we're declared righteous. We're righteousified, justified. God declares that we're not guilty, 
More than that, he says, you are righteous. You are right with me. You are in perfect relationship with no guilt. All of the charges against you are dismissed. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, doesn't that create a problem, though? I mean, imagine if you're in a human courtroom and there's someone standing in the dock who is utterly guilty. Everyone knows that they're guilty. Even they know that they're guilty. But the judge says to them, not guilty. Now, we wouldn't think that that was a particularly good judge. Uh, we wouldn't say that that judge is just because they've just let a guilty person go free. They've just declared a guilty person not guilty. But isn't that what God is doing with us? We're absolutely guilty, as, as Romans has painstakingly unpacked for us. So how can a just and righteous God say not guilty, but righteous instead? Can you see the problem? Paul can see the problem uh, as he writes as well, because notice what he says in verses 25 and 26. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Paul is saying that God is actually demonstrating his righteousness. He's acting rightly and justly. He's both just, that is, punishing sin, not letting sins go unpunished. But he's also, at the same time, the one who justifies, who declares righteous those who have faith in Jesus. Now, how can he do both those things at once? How can he be both just and justifying people who have done the wrong thing? Because he doesn't leave our sins unpunished. And he doesn't just ignore them or dismiss them. He doesn't say, yeah, you're guilty, but I'll just forget about it. No, sin needs to be dealt with. There's a price that needs to be paid. God's anger at sin needs to be poured out. But God does that in Jesus. And because Jesus is none other than God himself, God actually takes the punishment of sin upon himself. He pays the price himself, bears the cost himself. We're saved by God's grace alone. And God's grace comes to us through Jesus Christ alone. It must be Jesus alone because no one else is God himself who puts himself in our place and bears the punishment for our wrong. So in Jesus, God is just. He punishes sin. It's not ignored. It's not left unpunished. But at the same time, in Jesus, God justifies us. He declares us right with him, not guilty, but righteous, because the perfect righteousness of Jesus is given to us. So at the same time, God is both just and the one who justifies. But the only way he can do that is through Jesus alone. So it's by God's grace alone, and it's through Jesus alone. And thirdly, the way that we receive this salvation from God is by faith alone. You see the importance of faith all the way through this passage. In verse 22, we read that God's righteousness is given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. In verse 26, we see that those who are justified are those who have faith in Jesus. In verse 27, it's not the law which requires works, but the law which requires faith. In verse 28, people are justified by faith apart from the works of the law. In verse 30, God justifies the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. 
So over and over and over again, it's emphasised that this is all God's work through Jesus. It's not our work that achieves anything. All we do is receive God's work by faith. That is, we believe it and we trust in God. Now, we need to be really clear on this point because we're often so keen to think that, you know, we're going to contribute something to our own salvation that we can even make faith itself a sort of work and say, well, our, our, this is our contribution to our rescue. But faith is not particularly special in and of itself. Think about it like this. Imagine I'm diagnosed with a particularly rare and aggressive form of cancer. There's no cure for it. The doctor says to me, go home and put your affairs in order. But then the next day, the doctor rings me and says, he's just discovered that there's a new drug that's come out. It's designed particularly for exactly the cancer that I have. It's taken years of research and development. It's been tested and tested. There are no known side effects for this drug, but it's been found to be a surefire way to rid my body of this cancer. Would I like to try it? And so I say, yes and I swallow that pill. And it works, miraculously, I'm cured. Now here's the question, would I have any basis for boasting that I had cured myself or contributed to my cure? I mean, after all, I had to decide to swallow that pill. I had to trust that the pill might help me. I even had to swallow the thing. Isn't it amazing that I did all of that and it led to my cure? No, it isn't. And faith is like that. God's taken the initiative by his grace. Jesus has done all the work through his life and death and resurrection, and he offers it to us freely and openly as a gift. And all we do is say, yes, thank you, God. Thank you for this wonderful gift. I'm happy to receive it. What we're doing is we're recognising that Jesus is the wonderful cure to the problem of unrighteousness and sin and separation from God. And we say, yes, Jesus, we want you. Now, is that something that you've done? If you've never said yes to Jesus, can I urge you to do that? Right, God's taken the initiative. God's reached out to you in his grace. And Jesus has done all the work to redeem you, to sacrifice himself for you, to give you his righteousness. There's nothing left that you need to do except to say yes to God's gracious gift of Jesus. You just need to tell God that it's a yes, that you want to receive his gift of Jesus, that you want to follow Jesus and come under his good and loving rule. You can do that quietly through a prayer to God. Or if you'd like to chat further to someone about it, please make contact with us and we would love to speak to you further about it. And for those of us who've already done this, we need to remember that we never, ever leave these truths behind. It is all God's gracious initiative. We're saved by God's grace alone. And it's all done by Jesus. We're saved through Jesus alone. And our only response is to say yes to Jesus. We're saved by faith alone. So that means that there is absolutely no basis for us boasting. We haven't saved ourselves. We haven't done anything to merit saving. All we've done is trusted Jesus. But what it also means is that we can have certainty about our standing with God. Because it's not dependent on how good you or I have been this past week or how hard we've worked for God. God declares us righteous. He says to us, you and I are, are right. We're okay. But that's not because of your righteousness. It's because of Jesus' righteousness. Remember, it is God's grace alone. 
It's through Jesus alone. And all we need to do is to put our faith alone in Jesus. That's a solid foundation for you to build your life on. That frees you, releases you to go out and live for Jesus. That can give you the confidence that in him you are right with God and just get on with living it out for him. Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace that you took the initiative and reached out to us. Thank you, Jesus, for your work that you have redeemed us, that you've sacrificed yourself for us, that you have given us your righteousness. Help us to be people who respond with a resounding yes, the yes of faith. I pray for those who need to make that decision for the first time, that they would give you that yes and commit themselves to you, Lord Jesus. And I pray for all of us that our lives would be lived by faith day by day, that each day it would be a renewed yes to Jesus, receiving the righteousness that he offers and standing on that firm foundation to go out and live for him. And we pray that in his name. Amen. Grace alone, Jesus alone, faith alone. How good is it to hear this good news? There is nothing more for us to do but to say yes to Jesus and accept this gift. Nothing that we can boast in but Christ alone. Let's do that now with the song, I Will Boast in Christ.
everyone. My name is Dushi and I will lead you in prayer today. Please join me in the prayer by responding, hear our prayer when I say, Lord, in your mercy. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. There is nothing any of us can do to gain the right standing before God. Jesus, forgive us for the times we trusted only in our knowledge and abilities and failed to acknowledge your grace. Jesus, we accept your grace today and place our trust in you. Fill us with your love, peace and joy to live our lives the way you wanted us to be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, we pray for the leaders of our church, the staff and the mission workers worldwide. We thank you for their leadership, talents and generosity of everyone who are serving you and sharing your good news. We pray for your continuous blessing of courage, energy, good health, and your Holy Spirit guidance as they serve you and work through challenging issues. Give zealous in our hearts for you and raise up more people for leadership roles and volunteers to fill the many vacancies that exist in the church communities. Lord, you know the barriers that prevent us from taking these roles and we pray for your help to overcome those barriers and provide us with the support to take up these roles to serve you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father, we pray for leaders of our country and the leaders worldwide. We pray for your wisdom to guide their every decision. Help them to understand the needs of vulnerable people, to be compassionate, and to work with integrity for the benefits of all the people. We pray for people living in war zones, nations in civil unrest, and everyone who struggles for the basics of life. Lord, we pray, the lead, pray that the leaders of nation to take strong stand for justice and peace and to distribute the resources equally to alleviate the suffering of many people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, thank you for your promise that you will always be with us and you will refresh our life with your love. We bring all our worries, needs and challenges we are facing today and the uncertainties of tomorrow to you. Lord, we pray for wisdom to understand your will. Courage to start over again. Strength to face the challenges. Comfort amid losses. Restored health and deliverance from pain. Opportunities to find jobs. Renewed relationship to share your love. Patience as we wait for the unanswered prayers and trust in your timing. Let's pause for a moment to bring all the prayers in our hearts before God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please accept our prayers, Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We will now say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from the evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thanks Dushi for your prayers. Two words that change the trajectory of the bad news of humanity. But now. But now righteousness is given through faith in Jesus. But now all are justified freely by his grace. If you've said yes to Jesus today, what a great day it is. Don't let this go without telling someone. Reach out at stjohnsdc.org.au and let us know through the connect button. We'd love to support you through this decision and celebrate with you. 
or maybe just tell a trusted Christ Christian friend. Regardless, let someone know. Don't let this go unnoticed. That brings us to the end of our service today. As we finish, let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. We pray that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his presence abiding in us he may raise us to joys eternal. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. We'll see you again online soon.